First Wednesdays is sponsored by the Vermont Humanities Council and by the Kellogg Hubbard Library, with video production supported by Orca Media. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the first Wednesday's event um, like this, but there's a number of other kinds of programming that the Humanities Council does that really has an impact on our state. And you know, the mission of the Vermont Humanities Council is to engage all Vermonters in the world of ideas, foster a culture of thoughtfulness, and inspire a lifelong love of reading and learning. And that's something we really need um, these days. And you know, we do that work through a number of public programs like this, but there are less visible things too. For example, our work with incarcerated Vermonters or fragile readers or the summer humanities camps for at-risk youth. Um, so you know, I hope that you'll uh, take a moment to find out more about the Humanities Council, and I'm not uh, afraid to ask for uh, your support uh, in making those programs and programs like this one possible. Um, I also just, again, really want to thank the library for uh, helping us put on this event and, and also acknowledge Peter's service. Uh, Peter has just been a transformational leader for our organization and uh, has made such an impact in the state of Vermont. We're so uh, blessed, really, to have had him in that role, and I just want to acknowledge his service again. Thank you, Peter. Um, but it's my pleasure now to introduce Ed McMahon, and I'm going to just uh, quickly read his bio. Ed McMahon is one of America's most incisive analysts of land use and economic development issues and trends. He holds the Charles Fraser Chair on Sustainable Development and is Senior Resident Fellow at the Urban Land Institute in Washington, D.C., where he conducts research and, ed and educational activities on land development policies and practices. He is nationally known as an inspiring and thought-provoking speaker. He also serves on the board of the Vermont-based Orton Family Foundation and is the chairman of the board of the National Main Street Center. Before joining the Urban Land Institute in 2004, Ed worked for the Conservation Fund, a national land conservation organization. He also served as president of the nonprofit group Scenic America, taught at the Georgetown University School of Law, and served as an officer in the U.S. Army. Many of his articles and talks, including a recent TED Talk, are available online. You know, and I would just say from a, a personal standpoint, in my, in my day job, 
I serve as the Director of Community and Economic Development for USDA Rural Development. And uh, when I heard that Ed was coming, I sent an email to a number of my colleagues to say, hey, you guys should come see this. And uh, you would not believe the responses I got back. That I saw Ed in college, I was in grad school, I serve on a board with him. Um, the man has groupies. Um, and, but in all seriousness, um, to really think about what kind of legacy that is for a person to have had an influence on so many practitioners of community and economic development, you know, that has really affected their careers in a positive way, and ultimately those people are helping to affect change in rural communities. Uh, it's a fantastic legacy, and we're really honored to have him here tonight. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Ben. Uh, Rachel, Peter, it's great to be here. Uh, I think in March, uh, I was snowed out, but you guys were snowed in. So uh, it's great to be back here in, uh, in Vermont. It, you know, I'm always nervous about introductions, and I realize how perilous intro introductions could be. Some years ago, when my wife showed up at one of my talks, and I was, of course, interested in so what my wife had to, you know, had to say about what my talk was about. And so she came up to me after and I said, so what'd you think? And she said, well, that was just fine. But she said, I want to talk about the introduction. And, and I said, well, so what? What do you mean? And she says, well, that was ridiculous. She said, the only thing they didn't say about you is they didn't say you were a model husband now, did they? <laughs> and I said, I said, no, no, that's a great idea. Maybe I'll add that to my bio. And she, and she says, go home and look up the definition of model in the dictionary. If you look up the definition, it's a small replica of the real thing. <laughs> So anyway, so that's, you have to be a little careful about introductions. But thank you, uh, Ben, once, once again. So I'm gonna, we're going to talk tonight about the uh, importance of place. We we'll talk a little bit about economic development and how the world is changing and so on. Uh, but I like to tell people how I got interested in this in the first place. And it really goes all the way back to the Vietnam War. And I was a young second lieutenant in the United States Army, and I had just finished uh, field artillery school and jungle warfare training, and I had orders to a small fire base in the central highlands of Vietnam where I was going to be a forward observer. Uh, and literally about 10 days before I'm supposed to fly off to Saigon, I get a call from the Pentagon, and I have a colonel on the other end of the line. He's with the personnel division at the Pentagon. He says to me, Lieutenant McMahon, would you have any interest in being reassigned to Germany? And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> Let me think about that. And he said, yes, Germany sounds extremely exciting. I would love to go to Germany. And I was really one of the very lucky few. And I was sent to Heidelberg, West Germany, which is the headquarters for the US military in Europe and also one of the most beautiful small cities on the planet Earth. And I spent the next two and a half years of my life traveling all over Europe in a helicopter with a general who I was the aide to. And that experience completely and totally changed my life. But I didn't realize how much it would change my life until I flew home to Birmingham, Alabama, where I grew up and drove home. And for the first time ever, I saw the American landscape with a completely different set of eyes. Because, ladies and gentlemen, to travel is to learn. And that's what we're going to try to do tonight, and that's what we try to do at the Urban Land Institute, where I work. We try to learn about what's working, what's not working, what might work better, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I think most of you would agree that you live in a very special place uh, here in Vermont. And, and I, one of the things that always impresses me about Vermonters is just their caring for place. But I want to tell you something that I've learned, and that is, is that no place, no place in the world today will stay special by accident. And of course, the reason for that is because the world is changing faster than ever. Now, I understand people don't like change, particularly people in small towns and rural areas often say they don't like change, but really there are only two kinds of change in the world we live in today. There is planned change and there is unplanned change. I mean, you can grow by choice or you can grow by chance. I mean, you can shape the future you want or you can just accept whatever comes along. You know, Abraham Lincoln used to put it this way, to say, the best way to predict the future is to create it yourself. So, you know, uh, development really is about choices. Uh, it's about, you know, should we develop in downtown or out on the highway? And by the way, I don't think that happy face makes the one on the right better, but nevertheless, it's about choices. Should we be developing on green fields or gray fields? Should we be developing for cars or for people? 
you know, it's about choices, but it's also about this. It's about our children. It's about our grandchildren. It's about the future, and it's about preparing for the future. It's also about balance and harmony. It's about that relationship between conservation and economic development, jobs and the environment, old and the new, people and the land. It's also about finding win-win solutions, I believe, to the problems that face us in America today. I'm one of those people who believe we spend way too much time in America fighting about what we disagree about, and not nearly enough time sitting down community by community to talk about what we do agree about. And I can tell you that there's one place in America we can reach consensus, that's in the local communities, because I want to tell you that I have found that most people care more about the place they live than the political party they belong to. And you can reach consensus about place and what kind of place you want to live in. But so you say, well, what's changing? And the answer to that is everything is changing. The economy is changing, technology, demographics, healthcare, transportation options and choices, you know, consumer attitudes, market trends, the weather is changing in case you haven't noticed. But you know, uh, let's talk about employment for a second. You know, uh, I mean, yes, manufacturing is down in America, uh, but business and professional services are up and healthcare and education is up even more. So when I was growing up in Birmingham, this was our leading employer. In fact, this was the biggest employer in the state of Alabama, but of course, U.S. Steel is gone today. It doesn't exist in Alabama anymore. Today, this is the largest employer in Alabama. It's called the University of Alabama at Birmingham and the 12 hospitals that make up the University of Alabama Medical Center in Birmingham which employs way more people than U.S. Steel ever did in medical research and all the health-related services and so on. So it's kind of typical of what's been going on uh, around the country. But you know, some of you may have heard of this guy, Richard Florida, he did this famous book called The Creative Class. He did another book more recently called The Great Reset. It talks about really about the, the recession and how the recession has sort of changed the underlying basics of economics uh, and the economy, and he says, you know, how we live, work, shop, and move around is going to change, and the communities that embrace the future will prosper, and those that do not will decline. And, you know, let's think about this. So, you know, I think we're in a global competition to attract and retain talented people, particularly young people. But, you know, when I got out of college, I mean, we had these recruiters would come to your college, and you'd interview with the recruiter, and then young people would move to wherever they would find a job. In other words, talent followed jobs, but today, jobs are following talent. And as it turns out, talent wants to live in great places, and that's something we'll talk a lot about tonight. So here's a, uh, I picked this up out of an airline magazine as I was flying on Frontier Airlines out to the West Coast not too long ago. And they had an ad from Bend, uh, Oregon, an economic development ad, and it didn't talk about low taxes or regulatory relief. It talked about their 25 breweries and their 80 miles of bike trails and their walkable downtown and the fact that you could go kayaking in the morning and snow skiing in the afternoon. It really was all about the quality of life, and they talked about people moving. There's so many communities like that. Unfortunately, in the United States, two-thirds, two-thirds of all small towns in the United States are losing population. A third are gaining population, and those thirds, some of them, it's the accident of geography. They are in the, the orbit of a large metropolitan area, or they have a college or a university, et cetera, but then there's some others that don't have any of those things, but they're still growing while others are shrinking. And so we'll talk tonight a little bit about what we've learned about why some towns are growing and some are shrinking. So let's talk about economic development. So when I was growing up in once again in Alabama, our model for economic development was all about cheap land and cheap gas and low cost positioning. And we thought all we needed to do was just widen all the highways. That was our rural economic development plan. And then we lined the highways with a bunch of junk. And we called that economic development. But today I want to tell you it's not about shotgun recruitment, it's about laser recruitment. It's not about low cost positioning, it's about high value positioning. It's not about cheap labor, it's about highly trained talent. And it's not about what you don't have, it's about what you do have. It's what people in the economic development world call asset-based economic development. 
It's about looking at your assets. And sometimes, obviously, some communities have more assets than others, but everybody's got assets. And it's really understanding what those assets are and how to grow them that really is important. And I want to tell you that quality of life is critically important today in the economic world. And you know, it used to be all about one transaction after another, but today it's not about transactions, it's about vision. And I want to suggest to you that the most important infrastructure investment in America is no longer roads, it is education. Education. So let's talk about this a little more. So, you know, most communities, particularly small communities, their idea of economic development is they put an industrial park out by the airport and they put in some sewer and water out there and then they try like crazy to get some plant factory or distribution center to move there. But of course in the entire country we only build a couple of hundred plants, factories, and distribution centers every year to do anything anymore. And so thousands of communities were never winning in that competition, but they were always what you called elephant chasing, going after that one big thing. So in big cities, it was the same. So first it was an arms race to build the biggest convention center in America. And of course, most cities will never win that arms chase. Then it was festival marketplaces, which worked fine in cities like Boston and Baltimore. But did you know there were 19 other cities that opened festival marketplaces that went bankrupt within three years after opening? Places like Toledo, Ohio, and Richmond, Virginia, and Jacksonville, Florida, they just thought, successful economic development and copying something someone else was doing. And then it was aquariums. So even a city like, you know, Canton, excuse me, Trenton, New Jersey said, uh, if we could just build a, an aquarium featuring the fish of New Jersey that we could save, can't, excuse me, not Canton, Trenton, Camden, New Jersey. Well, did that, they built that aquarium. It's a very nice aquarium, but did it save Camden, New Jersey? No. It did not, because successful economic development in America today is rarely, rarely about the one big thing. Much more frequently, it's about lots of small things, working synergistically together off of a plan that makes sense for you and your community. Now, I understand that, you know, we had 242 communities competing for Amazon, uh, and, but of course, only one community is going to get Amazon, and there are some of the people who are competing for it don't even want it because they're afraid of what it will do to their housing prices. We have three of the final sites in the Washington, D.C. area. Three of the final 20 are in the Washington metropolitan area. And we are already now the third highest, highest priced housing in America after San Francisco and New York. So we were saying, like, well, maybe it should go to a place like Baltimore that really needs it as opposed to a place like Washington where you've already got lots of jobs and high priced housing. So what about this idea of small, small development? You know, people look at this and say, well, you know, small steps, small businesses, small deals, small developments, but they can add up to big impact if you collectively look at that. And by the way, small developments and small economic development projects have less risk, more flexibility, easier to finance, uh, et cetera. But, you know, in fact, most uh, jobs in America are in small business today. Even if you go down to uh, the Research Triangle of North Carolina, which has the largest single research park in America, the Research Triangle Park, which has 40,000 workers in it, uh, the vast majority of those workers work in small businesses of 50 employees or less. In fact, 42% are working in firms of 20 employees or less. But of course, you probably know that all of the subsidies and tax breaks are going to big business uh, in America. And, you know, it, and I want you to think about this for a second. You know, we have two models that we could follow. And, and I understand that it makes sense sometimes if you want to get that Amazon. I mean, people have promised Amazon as much as $8 billion to attract their second headquarters, $8 billion of taxpayers' money. But what I want to suggest to you is suppose you took that same eight billion or you know or much less and you used it to revitalize small town main streets, for example. You know, one you know pits one community against another. It subsidizes big business. When the subsidies run out, then communities uh, companies either leave or threaten to leave. On the other hand, if you're investing in yourself, you create a, a diverse, durable, local economy. You create lasting assets that'll be there long after we're all gone. And 
you know, you're helping existing local businesses. Now, I'm not saying it's all of one or the other, but I think we neglect the small business side of this equation to the exclusion of the big. So let me just give you an example. So uh, New Jersey under Chris Christie had this program called Grow New Jersey. And they did things like this. So uh, Lockheed Martin had a facility uh, in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, employing 250 people. Well, under the Grow New Jersey plan, they gave Lockheed Martin $175 million to move to Camden, New Jersey. Uh, they don't have to pay any property taxes for the next 20 years. They didn't hire a single new employee, and they don't employ anybody from Camden. They simply moved their economic activity from Cherry Hill to about 10 miles away into Camden. And of course, they're one of the most profitable com companies in the country. And that's kind of what we're doing in lots of places uh, in the country. So let's talk about asset-based economic development. So I'll tell you a little story. Here's a guy, his name is Foster Fries. Probably most of you haven't heard of him. Some of you might. Foster Fries is a major contributor to Republican candidates uh, for Congress and so forth. He was Rick Santorum's leading contributor when he was running for president in 2012. But uh, Foster Fries runs a mutual fund company called the Brandywine Investment Group. About 40 years, this company, which was founded by his father, was headquartered in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. That's a busy suburb of Philadelphia. But Foster Freeze, he likes to fly fish. So every summer, he would fly up to Jackson, Wyoming to go fly fishing in the Yellowstone River and the Madison River and some others. And one day, he's stuck in traffic on the Schuylkill Expressway. And all of a sudden, a light bulb goes on his mind and says, hey, I can run a mutual fund company anywhere in the world. And so what does he do? He picks up his entire company, moves it into downtown Jackson, Wyoming. So now it's the largest private sector employer in Jackson, Wyoming. Why is it there? Access to outdoor recreation. You know, who would have thought that that was an economic development driver, but it is. You know, Montana State University did a study of every business relocation to the three Montana counties that abut Yellowstone National Park over a five-year period. It said, why'd you move here? And you know what the number one reason on the list was? And this was everything from doctors, small businesses, manufacturing, whatever. Uh, the number one reason was because of the beauty of the region. Now, isn't that interesting, the beauty of the region? Now, if you'd asked the Bozeman County Commissioners 25 years ago to do something to save the beauty of the region, like maybe to pass a sign ordinance, they would have said that was bad for business. Turns out it's just exactly the opposite. It's extraordinarily good for business. So I'm going to leave you with four thoughts about economic development, four key drivers. One is talent, thinking about how you attract and retain talented workers. Second is innovation, you know, thinking about how you generate new ideas and use that, turn those ideas into profitable businesses, like the Silicon Valley is a great example of innovation. But every small town can create a business incubator, which relates to the third thing, which is Connectivity, creating places where people and ideas can get together. So a co-working facility, for example, or a downtown or a college, lots of places like that. But the thing that I think people forget the most about is the one that's last on the list, distinctiveness, place. You know, place is more than a spot on a map. Place is not only what makes your hometown different from my hometown, but I believe it is explicitly that which makes our physical surroundings worth caring about that which makes our physical surroundings worth caring about. You know, I believe that successful communities today are distinctive communities, and so are sustainable, sustainable communities. And by the way, what does sustainable mean anyway? If you look it up in the dictionary, it means enduring. Enduring, a sustainable community, ladies and gentlemen, is a place of enduring value. So some of you probably heard this slogan that Austin uses, keep Austin weird. Well, they don't think it's just a funny slogan. They think of it as an economic development imperative. They think it means keep them on the cutting edge, keep them distinctive, unique, different. And where would you rather live anyway? In a place that's unusual and unique and different or someplace that's just like every place else? So, you know, distinctiveness has incredible value. In fact, here's a new book put out by the World Bank that for about 250 pages talks about all the various studies that make the point that if you can't differentiate your community from any other community in a world where capital is foot loose, you will have no competitive advantage. Or put another way, sameness is not a plus in the world we live in today. It is a minus. 
So, you know, Joe Courtright used to run the CEOs for cities, put it this way. He says the unique characteristics of a place may be the only truly defensible source of competitive advantage for cities and towns uh, in America today. The only truly defensible, it's the thing you can't replicate in another community. And so, you know, just look up the, the meaning of distinctive, or think about authenticity, this idea of being yourself, being genuine, being real. Uh, community character really does matter, as Mark Twain said, we take stock of a community or city or town, like we take stock of a man, the clothes or appearance are the externals by which we judge. Let's talk about a community's front door, its gateway, and just like with meeting a person, a good first impression is important and a bad first impression is hard to change. Do you think you'd rather visit the town of Franklin, Tennessee, or would you rather go to the town of Midfield, Alabama? Which one looks more like a community with a sense of pride and a sense of place? Which one looks more like a community that you would rather invest time or money in? If you don't remember anything else I say tonight, remember this. The image of a community is fundamentally important to its economic well-being. And what do I mean by that? I mean that every single day in America, people make decisions about where to live, where to invest, where to vacation, where to retire, based on what our communities look like. What they look like. Let's talk about tourism, for example. Tourism is kind of important because it is the biggest industry in the world. It's the first, second, or third largest industry in every American state. So this is the official travel guide for the state of Oregon. Check out their slogan. It says, Oregon, things look different here. Can you imagine a state travel brochure that said something like, Vermont, things look the same here? <laughs> well, of course not, because who'd want to go there? Tourism, at its very essence, is about visiting places that are different, unusual, and unique. The more any town in America comes to look exactly like every place else, the less reason there is to go there. On the other hand, the more a community does to enhance its distinctiveness, whether that's architectural or cultural or natural or artistic, whatever, the more people want to go there because that's exactly what tourism is. So, you know, in the old economy, it was all about markets. I want to suggest to you today, it's really much more about places, markets versus places. You know, the National uh, Association of Realtors puts it this way, say the place is becoming more important than the product. And what do they mean by that? What they mean is that what's going on outside of a house has much more impact on the value of a home than what's going on inside of a house. It's not a surprise that you could buy a beautiful Victorian house in Detroit for $18,000 up until just a few years ago. It wasn't about the house, it was all about the neighborhoods. You know, and then talk about, you know, the home builders used to do this study, and they've asked people, well, what would you rather have? Would you rather have a big lot or a small lot? And what do you think people would say to that? They would go, well, yeah, big lot, of course. So we decided to rephrase the question in a national public opinion poll that we did at the Urban Land Institute, and we said, asked this question. We said, if you were buying a house, what would be more important, having a big lot or living in a nice neighborhood? What do you think people said to that? It's a nice neighborhood by huge majorities. So really it's you know much more about the place than it is even when, you know, granite countertops aren't everything in the world today. You know, and you know it's interesting. So Mick Cornett, who's the head of the Republican Mayors Association, he likes to say that economic development is really the result of creating places where people want to be creating places where people want to be. So there's this foundation called the Knight Foundation. They got their money from the sale of the Knight Ritter newspapers, and they uh, fund in 26 cities that used to have Knight Ritter newspapers. And they did this study called the Soul of this Community Study, and it's one of the largest public opinion polls ever done in the United States. They surveyed you know, almost 40,000 people around the country, and they asked them, uh, they found a very interesting thing. They found that the places with the strongest attachment to place also had the strongest economies. And then they said, well, what is it that attaches people to place? They found it was three things. Social offerings. You know, things like, you know, places where you can get together and meet your neighbors, like a coffee house or a bookstore or a farmer's market, for example. 
They also talked about this idea of being welcoming to people who are different. You know, I was in a small town in the south some years ago, and somebody said to me, you know, we're very welcoming to people who aren't different. Well, I want to suggest to you that the communities that are going to be successful in the future are going to be the communities that are welcoming to everyone, not just people who are just like them. And then the last thing on the list was the character of a community, the aesthetics of a community, what it looked like. You know, I have a friend that used to be the dean at the School of Michigan School of Law, the School of Architecture. Yeah, the people used to say, but building a landscape or a city is not beautiful, it will not be loved. If it is not loved, it won't be maintained and improved. In short, it won't be sustained. You know, everybody's always talking to me about sustainable development, all about the new technologies and energy efficiency and all that. Yes, it's a lot of that. But once again, it's about creating places that people love and want to take care of, which is becoming more important in the world we live in today. This is what we try to do at the Orton Family Foundation. We try to help small communities get everybody involved because none of us are as smart as all of us. And when you ask everybody about what really matters, you know, you can reach consensus, as I said before, and that's what heart and soul planning is about. It's about trying to find out what really matters to people in a community. And oftentimes it's not, you know, what you would think when you first start asking that question. So let's talk about what are the dimensions of uniqueness. If you were really trying to think about this here in Vermont, what are some things you could think about or what, some, what are some communities think about? This is a list that I've sort of put together on this idea. Let's start off with anchor institutions. I mentioned, you know, so in 65 of the 100 biggest cities in America today, the largest employer is a college or a university or a hospital. Uh, Birmingham, Alabama is just an example of that. Or if you went to Philadelphia, now it's the University of Pennsylvania is the biggest employer, et cetera. But, you know, some anchor institutions engage with communities and some do not. You know, it's called that town-gown relationship. So let me tell you about the two biggest recipients of federal research dollars. Number one, John Hopkins University in Baltimore, $2 billion a year in federal research money. Number two, Stanford University, $1.8 billion a year in federal research dollars. Stanford kind of figured out how to commercialize that research and turned it into one of the greatest economic forces in the history of the world, the Silicon Valley. On the other hand, John Hopkins didn't really care what was going on in Baltimore. But did you know they started having an incredibly hard time attracting the best and the brightest to work at the Hopkins Medical Center? If you've ever been to the Hopkins Hospital, it was surrounded by basically a war zone there for many years. And finally, they figured out that the health of the city was tied to the health of the university and vice versa, and now they're investing billions of dollars in the surrounding neighborhood, the same way the University of Pennsylvania did in Philadelphia. So, you know, I think one of the biggest mistakes we ever made in America was putting all our community colleges out in the middle of cornfields instead of in our downtowns. So let me tell you what happened to the town of Hagerstown, Maryland. So the University of Maryland is a their flagship campus is right outside of Washington in a place called College Park, Maryland. For years, they've been talking about building a new campus in Western Maryland. And they had this guy who was on the board of trustees of the university, and he's, he owned some land off of Interstate 70, about nine miles outside of the town of Hagerstown, Maryland. He offered to give that land uh, to the university, and then he was going to build a light industrial park next to it. And the university was thrilled about that. Great, yeah, we'll put the university out there, you know, off the interstate. Meanwhile, they have this beautiful town that's dying. It has all these empty buildings, and the mayor of Hagerstown goes to the then governor, Paris Glendening, and says, why don't you put the university downtown? He goes, oh, that's a great idea. I never thought of that. They gave him the old department store and another block of buildings, and about five years ago, 3,000 students started going to school in downtown Hagerstown, Maryland. And, you know, there's nothing that brings a community back to life like young people in a downtown. And it's complete. And by the way, if you built the university out on the highway, everything, more stuff would have gone out of the town. Now, these things are moving back into the town, and that's the kind of way we need to think about cooperation. Let's talk about healthy downtowns. You know, why are downtowns important? Because they're the heart and soul of any community. You know, uh, you know it's interesting. The, uh, there's this magazine in the South called Southern Business and Development. It's basically for like industrial park developers. And the headline article recently was said, when site searching the, the South, make sure you inspect the communities downtown first. So why would an industrial park developer even care about a downtown? Because they realize that if you don't have a healthy downtown, you simply don't have a healthy city or town. 
the apple rots from the inside out. It's hard to be a suburb of nothing in America, and we've kind of figured that out. And by the way, now we've also learned that companies are all moving back downtown, and Cushman Wakefield did this study, found that in the last five years, almost 500 major American companies that have moved back into downtown from suburban office parks. People like General Electric and Motorola and McDonald's and Marriott, and I could go on and on and on, moving back into downtown. You say, well, why did they move there? And their number one reason was to attract and retain talented workers. They want to be in the middle of everything. They want to be where the action is. So this is the Amazon headquarters in downtown Seattle, but it used to be spread out all over the suburbs. Used to be only one way to get to the Amazon headquarters called drive your car. Well, of course, you can drive your car to the Amazon headquarters in Seattle now, but you could also take a bus, you could take a boat, you can take a train, you can ride your bike, or you could walk. And when you're at the end of the day, you're in the middle of everything. And you know, it's interesting that almost 50% of the employees at Amazon don't even own a car because now they can get there. That many of them live in the South Union, Lake Union neighborhood, et cetera. This is Frederick, Maryland, where my daughter lives. This was a dying small town in the 1970s and early 80s. It had a huge flood. And they decided, the then mayor decided, when we build back, we want to build back better. And so he decided to build a river walk through downtown, a small town version of the San Antonio Riverwalk. People thought he was crazy. Spent $11 million on this thing called the Carroll Creek Project. And what was interesting, within five years, there was $400 million in new investment along that creek. And today, this is the fastest growing town in all of Maryland. Today, this small town in their downtown has 5,000 residents, 800 businesses, 200 retailers and restaurants, and 25 small high-tech companies. It all started with an investment in themselves. What about historic resources? Why are historic buildings and neighborhoods and landscapes important? Well, there's lots of reasons, and I'm sure that, you know, I'm meeting tomorrow with Paul Brun, who's the head of the Vermont Preservation Trust, and, you know, I think you've got more than your fair share of great historic buildings in this state, and I know most of you treasure these buildings, but sometimes we forget why they're so important. So let me tell you a couple of, let me show you a couple of slides that I think illustrate what I'm going to talk about. So some of you probably read some of the books by Thomas Wolfe. He wrote Look Homeward Angel, and he penned the immortal line, You Can't Go Home Again. Well, sadly, Tom Wolf, he can't go home again, at least in his original house, because here it is in this parking lot down in Asheville, North Carolina. Why are historic buildings important? I would suggest it first and foremost, because these are the places that physically connect us to the past. These are the places that tell us who we are and where we came from. Ladies and gentlemen, a city without a past is like a man without a memory. You know, as Daniel Webster once wrote, he said, quote, the man who feels no sentiment or veneration for the memory of his forefathers is himself unworthy of kindred regard and remembrance. At its essence, saving the historic buildings of Vermont or any state is about saving this heart and soul of that place. But it's also incredibly important to its economic well-being as well. So I had mentioned that I chair the National Main Street Center Board. We work with about 2,000 small towns uh, using the grassroots, bottom-up economic development approach called the Main Street Approach. And this was one of the first towns, Sheboygan Falls, Wisconsin. And that used to be the fire station in Sheboygan Falls, and it you know, had been turned into a pizza parlor. And kind of like a lot of small towns, this was a town going downhill. And one of the four points of the Main Street program is design, restoring the facades of old buildings. So they did that you know, tells a story about the history of the building, but guess what else happened? Well, it, sales of pizza almost doubled. We sustained that over a multi-year period. So let me show you a couple of nationally famous examples. So welcome to New Orleans. So, of course, this is the French Quarter, and I, I spent, I've spent a lot of time in New Orleans, both because I have a sister that lives there, but also I was one of the consultants brought in by the city of New Orleans in the state of Louisiana after Hurricane Katrina and asked to put together a redevelopment plan for the city. And of course, they didn't want just a physical redevelopment plan, they wanted an economic redevelopment plan. So all the consultants, we said, well, what's your biggest industry? Is it the oil industry, the seafood industry, the chemical industry? No, no, the biggest industry in the entire state of Louisiana, number one, is the tourism industry. And what is the biggest, what is the engine of that industry? Well, you're looking at it, it's called the French Quarter. But did you know that for about 40 years, the state of Louisiana wanted to put a freeway 
through the French Quarter? I want to suggest to you that that is more important and more valuable than any plant, factory, or distribution center in the entire state of Louisiana. But they didn't really think about that. They do now, and they recognize it for the economic engine that it is in that city. Well, let's go over to Texas and visit the San Antonio Riverwalk, the number one destination in all of Texas. The basis of that city's multi-billion dollar a year annual tourism industry and the single defining characteristic of the city but what most people don't know is that at some point in the past, the city thought so little of that small river, they actually wanted to put it underground into a culvert. Today, it's the most visited place in Texas. Let's fly out to Seattle and go to the Pike Place Farmers Market, the number one destination in Washington State. But once again, there were people on the city council about 30 years ago that wanted to tear down the Pike Place Market, and why? They said, oh, well, we need more downtown parking. <laughs> like parking for what? And, you know, parking is important, but, you know, like parking for what? You know, all the parking in the world, if there's nothing to do, no one's ever going to want to go there. So if you have a parking problem, that usually means you're successful. If you have something that people want to see and do. So they saved that place, and now, as I said, the most visited place in all of Washington State. Or how about, let's go to Miami Beach and visit the Art Deco Historic District, the largest place of Art Deco buildings in America. They were all going to be torn down, and there were people saying, well, we got to have more high-rise condos in South Florida. Any, any of you guys ever been to South Florida and see, think they got a lack of high-rise condos down there? In fact, they have many, many high-rise condos that are all sold out and no one lives in them because they're all owned by someone from South America or Mexico or Russia. They're basically a safety deposit box in the sky. You just put your money into this building. But now you go to South Beach and it's one of the greatest urban places in North America. I never forget taking my 20-something children to my, I wanted to get them out to the Everglades and they were in South Beach. They kept saying, Dad, you don't want to go out to the Everglades. You want to stay here. Come on, kids, go to the Everglades, you know. How about the Camden Yards baseball stadium in Baltimore? Probably the most influential sports stadium ever built in North America, not just because it was a new stadium, but because it was the first of the so-called retro stadiums. It did the best job of integrating new construction with historic buildings that surrounded that site. You know, the field is 12 feet below the street level, so it didn't tower over the row houses that surround the stadium. It was a good neighbor. That's a thought, having new fit in with old, being a good neighbor. And as, you know, Arthur Fromer, probably the leading travel writer in America, likes to say, among cities and towns with no particular recreational appeal, those who preserve their past continue to enjoy tourism. Those that haven't receive almost no tourism at all. Tourists simply won't go to a city or town that has lost its soul. <coughs> But it's about a lot more things than tourism. It's about jobs, and it's about affordable housing, it's about environmental impacts, it's about lots of things. Uh, and I mentioned the Main Street program, and this is what incremental economic development can do for you. Billions of dollars of investment, hundreds of thousands of jobs and businesses. And instead of giving us $8 billion, we've generated $32 in private investment for every $1 in public money that the public has given us over the last 20 years. So I would call that effective economic development. Now let's talk about how preservation is changing. So at the Urban Land Institute, we do a report every year called Emerging Trends in Real Estate. And we interview people all over the country, developers, bankers, finance people. Uh, and we say, well, what, what's working in real estate? What are, the, what are the best investments now, et cetera? And, and in 2016, we found a very interesting thing. We found that we that office space in restored industrial buildings like old mills were commanding higher rents than new class A office space in the United States. Commanding new, higher rents than new class A office space. So I just come to show you a couple of examples. So this used to be a derelict wharf in Boston. Now it's, of course, the world headquarters for the Converse Shoe Company. Or how about the Sears Distribution Center in Seattle? Now it's the Starbucks world headquarters. Or how about this abandoned power plant in Toledo, Ohio, and now it's the headquarters for this international medical supply company called ProMedica. But it's also happening in small towns all over America, too. So this is an abandoned mill in western Maryland, a place called Cumberland, Maryland. Well, now it's a brew pub, it's apartments, restaurant, etc. And this really makes sense. And by the way, all the creative class employers say they want to live and be in spaces with character. 
character. And they like these old buildings because it's easy to move things around. You know, and they like the flexibility of this kind of space. What about hotels? You know, I, I was on a, I was brought out to Indiana last year to speak at the Indiana Preservation Trust annual meeting. It was in a place called Richmond, Indiana. It's kind of a nice little small city. But there was no downtown hotel. And they put me up at the Hampton Inn, which was on the highway outside of town. The only thing I could walk to from the Hampton Inn was a Jiffy Lube. <laughs> And that's kind of what we did for years. We just, we didn't build any hotels in our downtown and we, you know, they were all out on the highway somewhere. But you know, it's interesting. So Marriott did a study that basically has been replicated by virtually all the big hotel chains and found that for young people in particular, authenticity and interesting were more important than comfortable and predictable in lodging facilities. And they also said they wanted to stay in places that they could walk to something like in a downtown. So all the hotel chains have started to change their operation because the consumer attitudes have changed in market. So we're seeing things like this, like an old department store being turned into a hotel or an old factory being turned into a hotel or an old brewery to being turned into a hotel or even a mental hospital in Buffalo being turned into a hotel. Or how about this one? They took an abandoned grain mill and turned it into a Hilton hotel. And this is part of the Quaker Oaks redevelopment in downtown Akron, which was the beginning of the turnaround in downtown Akron. You know, and I just want to end on this point. I mean, these, we have historic buildings have great economic value, and we just need to look at the potential there. And, you know, we, we, we have so many more opportunities to reuse the places that we already have. All right, so let's talk about parks and green space for a second. There are literally hundreds of studies that show that green space increases the value of adjacent property. So where's the most valuable land in New York? There it is. It's the land next to Central Park. So what about golf courses? Let's talk about, you know, like here in Vermont, for example. So for years, all the all these developers wanted to build golf course developments. And why did they want to build golf course developments? Because they found out you can charge a lot premium from 10 to 25% more for a house next to a golf course over and above, you can be charged with the exact same house, not next to a golf course. But they found out something very interesting. Did you know that the vast majority of buyers in golf course developments always didn't play golf? So you ask them, well, why did you buy the house there? They said, oh, well, we like the view across the fairway. We like to live next to protected open space. Well, duh. What's it cost to build a golf course? Millions of dollars. What's it cost to maintain a golf course? Millions of dollars. What's it cost to leave the open space alone in the first place? Like almost nothing. So all of a sudden, developers started to figure out they could build a golf course development without the golf course. It's what we used to call conservation communities. Have you heard the term agro hoods? Now we're building new housing developments around working farms all over the United States. CBS Sunday morning had a big special on this just recently. It's happening all over us because we have a foodie generation. People like local everything, green and sustainable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And parks can create incredible vitality in a community. You know, you've all heard of the High Line in New York City. Of course, Rudolph, 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 Mayor Giuliani thought it was way too expensive, and it was expensive, $148 million. But did you know that it has leveraged $4 billion of new investment directly adjacent to it? It's generated 12,000 new jobs and it is now the number two tourist attraction in all of New York State. You know, but this is, you know, where we're creating new parks. You know, where do you find parkland in already developed cities? Well, places like parking lots. So that, those two parking lots are now the park of Fort Worth, Texas, called Sundance Square. We're redoing highway ramps and bridges and all kinds of abandoned rail lines, abandoned railroad yards all over the country. Let me tell you about a small town example. So I, was, I fly around the country every year and take pictures in lots of small towns. And a couple years ago, I went to Southwest Texas and photographed 13 courthouse squares. One of them was in this town, Sulphur Springs, Texas. And they had this beautiful courthouse. They got great courthouses in Texas. They probably have, they, by the way, they have 264 counties in Texas. And they, they're little counties, too, so it's easy to get around. They all have little squares around them. Uh, and, you know, they only had one event a year on downtown, though. One event a year. It's called the 4th of July. You know, so creating a park is not just about the, the hard infrastructure. It's about the soft infrastructure. It's about activities and programs and so on. Of course, they took that little courthouse square and they put a splash pad there. 
Then they started to have birthday parties there. And then now they had festivals and heart fairs and classes and concerts. And you know now this is, was voted the most improved town in Texas. Now they have 300 events a year on that square. And best guess what? The town square has come back to life because people are actually going downtown again because this place that they just, they had the green space, they just weren't doing anything with the green space. So anyway, those are some of the things that they're doing there. They put an outdoor chess set. I mean, just kind of fun, nothing, not really, nothing really expensive. Uh, so bicycling, I, I'm not going to say a lot. I could just give you a whole talk on cycling. Bicycling is the fastest growing form of transportation in America by far. Well, why? Well, because first of all, what's it cost to own and operate a car in America? $9,000 a year for, for a compact car. Young people are now telling us that mobility is more important than ownership. And you know, when I was a teenager, 92% of all 18-year-olds had a driver's license. Today, it's 67%. Lots of young people, lots of people don't even care if they own a car anymore because of Uber and Lyft and car to go and on and on and on. Bicycles. What about arts and culture? So I think the state, and I commend the Humanities Council and the Arts Council for doing lots of great things here in Vermont. But I want to just talk a little bit about public art, which is something I have a personal interest in. And public art, I like public art, particularly place-making public art. And by that I mean public art that tells you where you are. Uh, doesn't have to relate to any particular style or medium, but it somehow relates to the history or the geography of culture or the terrain of a place. And so Dolly Parton you know, grew up in Sevierville, Tennessee, so they have her on Main Square. Uh, and that's kind of appropriate, I guess. Or Thurgood Marshall, who grew up in Maryland, we have him on uh, down in Annapolis, etc. Uh, and you know, it, you could celebrate famous people like Buddy Holly or Babe Ruth or William Faulkner, etc., or famous events like, you know, the Great Depression. By the way, every, this is at the Franklin Memorial, Roosevelt Memorial in D.C. And every time you go there, you'll see people lining up with the bread line to have a picture taken uh, with the people. One of the favorite sculptors in D.C. Or, or the sit ins, etc. But you know, I know some of you say, well, we don't have any famous people in our town. Well, so what? You got. Ordinary people, the people who built your town. Maybe it was the lumberman, or maybe it was the waterman, or maybe it was the coal miners, or maybe it was the settlers or the ranchers. So there's lots of people you could celebrate. And you know, all this is really about telling your story. This is the Chisholm Trail mural in Fort Worth. It celebrates the cattle drives that were the reason for the founding of Fort Worth. But this is my little hometown, Tacoma Park, Maryland. That's our family album, and every one of those pictures is important to the history of our town. So the picture on the uh, right there on the middle says Wiley's. Wiley's was the ice cream parlor that was the inspiration for the TV show Happy Days, just as one example. And, and so it's our family album. Or how about this? This is Nashville, New Hampshire. That's the Yankee Flyer Diner mural. And the Yankee Flyer Diner used to be an institution in Nashville. It burned down in a fire. They decided to bring it back to life and put it in this mural. I mean, how'd they pay for the mural? Well, all the people in the mural are real people who live in Nashville. They all pay to have their pictures put in the mural. So where there's a will, there's a way. Or how about things baseball bat in America? Well, it's appropriate that it's in downtown Louisville because that's where they make all of the Louisville Slugger baseball bats that are used in the major leagues for baseball. Or how about the, the big postcard in Orlando? You want to see what old Florida looks like? Well, they'll show you what old Florida looks like. Or maybe integrating art into infrastructure. Some of you may have seen the Frog Bridge goes from Norwich to Hanover. You know, we used to always integrate art and infrastructure in the 30s and 40s, and then we just kind of forgot about that, and everything was about utilitarianism. We could do it again. How about putting, using our water towers? So, Luling, Texas is the watermelon capital of Texas. Or Planton, Alabama, the peach capital of Alabama. And I could go on and on. I was just out in Driggs, Idaho, which is building a new water tower with a potato on the top just as an example. Or how about this? This is the Yankee Flyer Diner, excuse me, the Yankee Flyer Wagon, Radio Flyer Wagon in Spokane, Washington, where they used to manufacture Radio Flyer Wagons. So now you have a piece of public art, something that tells you about the history of the place and a piece of playground equipment all wrapped into one. Or how about Hershey, Pennsylvania, where all the streetlights are Hershey Kisses. You know, or, you know, and I understand that you doesn't always have to tell a story. Sometimes public art can just add fun and whimsy and interest and excitement to the streetscape. Every small town in Vermont's got some big blank wall like this, and what could you do with a blank wall like that? Well, maybe you could do this. <laughs> they finally had to put a sign up that people were going to drive into this thing. <laughs> this is down in 
in Columbia, South Carolina. It's called Tunnel Vision. It's a prompt blow up your heart. Retail. Let's talk about retail. So strip mall coming soon. I want to suggest to you this is the old model for development and that strip malls are retail for the last century. And that the future, ladies and gentlemen, belongs to downtowns and the main streets and town centers and mixed use development. And there's lots of reasons for that. First of all, because we completely overbuilt on suburban retail for 40 years. And then, of course, we have something now called the internet and internet shopping. And, you know, did you know that we have twice as much retail space in America per person as any other country in the world? And we completely overbuilt. You can shut that off. It must be my, one of my grandchildren calling me, no, no doubt. Sorry if I have to turn that off. Um, <laughs> it's in the front there. So let's talk about this. So we built for, right before the recession, we were building retail space in America five times faster than retail sales. Which, of course, is why when you open one strip center, we cannibalize another strip center. Open one mall, we cannibalize another mall, etc. And, of course, you know, now in the last, since the recession, we've closed 350 enclosed malls in the United States. We've opened one in Las Vegas. We've, we're going to close another 300 in the next five years, and the rest are being turned inside out and repurposed. Well, let me give you an example. So this... In the 1970s, this is the county seat of where I live, Montgomery County, Maryland. And then in their infinite wisdom in the 1970s, they decided to tear down almost their entire downtown and replace it with this lovely mall you see in the background called Rockville Mall. But guess what? Now they're pulling the mall down, put the downtown back. <laughs> and it's kind of a metaphor for America. We're going to be looking back on these things and saying, what were we thinking when we did those kind of things? And you know, we had, when I moved to Washington to go to law school many years ago, we had 11 enclosed malls. Eight of them are now gone, replaced with mixed-use walkable development. And that's going on all over the world. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the new promised land. You know, Joni Mitchell used to say, tear up paradise and put in a parking lot. Well, now we can tear those parking lots up and put paradise back. And why? Because this is where we already have our sewer and water. This is where we already have our infrastructure. These are what we call gray fields. And these are one of our greatest redevelopment opportunities. So yeah, you can keep doing this, you know, drive alone by itself, single use, etc. Or maybe you could try something like this, where people are actually sleeping upstairs and shopping downstairs. And who might want to do that? Well, some of the 75% of American households who do not have school-aged children might want to do that. People who might want to be able to walk to a few things might want to do that. Well, you say, I couldn't do that in my small town. Maybe you could do something like this. Here's a brand new Dairy Queen in the south town of, small town of Herndon, Virginia, with a dentist's office upstairs. How appropriate. <laughs> and you know, let's talk about even Walmart. You know, for years, they just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Now they're getting smaller and smaller smaller. And by the way, there's only one place left in America with more spending power than stores, and that's in our cities and in our downtowns. And so this is the new model for the Walmarts of America. That's the first of three Walmarts in, in Washington, D.C. That's in a five-story building with 200 apartments above the Walmart. There's a swimming pool on the roof. Where's the parking? It's under the building. And by the way, there are real windows in that Walmart that let in real sunlight onto the floor of the store. And that's the model for the future, mixed-use development. They're even doing that down in uh, Bentonville, Arkansas, because they couldn't get people to want to move to Bentonville. So they're actually investing hundreds of millions of dollars to turn it into a walkable, pedestrian-friendly community, kind of like Montpelier. And, you know, it's so interesting that the icon of American suburbia is now helping to rebuild many of our cities and towns. So let me give you another example. So I was in Bentonville visiting the... Walmart Family Foundation, and, I'm, we, and we took a tour at Bentonville, then we went down to Fayetteville, and I'm driving down the interstate, and I see this Waffle House out on the highway. You guys have all seen Waffle Houses on highways before, but then I get into downtown Fayetteville, there's another Waffle House in a brand new building with three floors of apartments upstairs, and I said, well, that's interesting. I've never seen a new Waffle House with apartments. There's no parking in front of the building except on-street parking. So I thought that's kind of interesting. So I went over to the Founders City Hall, Fayetteville City Hall, went over and said, you guys know anything about that Waffle House? And they go, yeah. We did a study on that Waffle House. Turns out that downtown Waffle House is outperforming the Waffle House out on the highway. But more importantly, it's producing more taxes per acre, more jobs per acre, 
more residents. There are 42 people who live upstairs above the Waffle House in downtown Fayetteville. No one lives above the Waffle House out on the highway. And by the way, this is why the future belongs to mixed-use development, because it's outperforming single-use drive-only development everywhere in America. And there's this thing in the real estate world we call the place-making dividend, and what it means is people stay longer, come back more often, and spend more money in places that attract our affection. So I want to end, uh-oh, they just ran out here. Should I get one back? Yeah, okay, I want to just end by sharing with you what I call my secrets of successful communities. I've been in this business for a very long time. I've come to some conclusions about why some cities and towns are succeeding and many others are failing. It all starts with a vision for the future. Now, some people might call that a plan for the future. And I grew up in a part of the world where planning was a dirty word. And people would say, I'm against planning. And I'd say, OK, well, then you tell me the name of any successful organization, institution, corporation, or community that doesn't plan for the future. Failing to plan simply means planning to fail. As the book of Proverbs says, without vision, the people will perish. And successful visions always begin by inventorying your assets. And then successful communities build their plans around their existing assets, whether it's a tourism plan, a land use plan, an economic development plan, what have you. And successful communities use education, incentives, partnerships, and voluntary initiatives, not just regulation. Now, I didn't say I'm against regulation, it prevents bad things from happening. Sets a minimum standard of conduct, but you've got to use carrots, not just sticks. You need to make it easy to do the right thing. And, you know, today, you have made it easy in many places to do the wrong thing. Time is money in the development business. Make it easy to put development where you want it. Successful communities pick and choose among development proposals. You know what the biggest impediment to small town development, better development in America is today? It's a fear of saying no to anything. Well, if you're afraid to say no to anything, you get the worst of everything. Communities that aren't willing to say no to bad development will compete to the bottom. Communities that say no to bad development will compete to the top because they know if you say no to bad development, you're always going to get better development in its place. Successful communities cooperate with their neighbors for mutual benefit. Successful communities consider what they look like. Successful communities have strong leaders and committed citizens. So when I was growing up in Birmingham, there was only one city we made fun of, Chattanooga, Tennessee. It was called the most polluted city in America, routinely referred to as a patch of rust in the Sun Belt, but nobody makes fun of Chattanooga anymore. Now it's known as an international model for community revitalization. It all began with a vision for the future. And they did some remarkable things like this. This is the Walnut Street Bridge in downtown. It's an obsolete highway bridge. The Tennessee DOT had set aside millions of dollars for its demolition. And Chattanooga said, no, we have a better idea. Give us the same amount of money. Let us turn it into the nation's longest pedestrian bridge now connects one side of the Tennessee River with the other side. Or how about public buildings? This used to be the city hall in a small town in Northern California, Susan City, California. And you know, public buildings are kind of in, you know, it's a two double wide trailers. This was the only city hall in California that had a regular department of motor vehicles. But you know, public buildings are kind of important. And they were always our most beautiful building before World War II, whether it was the public school or the library or the courthouse or the post office. And they were always in the middle of our downtowns. And then starting in the middle of the 60s, we decided cheaper was better. You know what we've learned? We've learned that cheaper is simply cheaper. And you know what they said in Susan City? Why would anybody invest in a community that wouldn't invest in itself? And so they built a new city hall right in that same spot. And a decade later, this was voted one of the best places to live in Northern California, but it all began with an investment in themselves. Successful communities inventory their assets. Sometimes the assets are really easy to see, like in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, world-class scenery, unparalleled wildlife resources. Or how about Annapolis, Maryland, unbelievable architectural legacy. And they built their plans, both of these views around preserving what they already have. Sometimes the assets to me are not very obvious. Welcome to Lowell, Massachusetts. It was a dying industrial city. Had an unemployment rate of 27%. Thought it had no assets, but what it had was abandoned textile mills had a vision for the future, and now, of course, they've restored all of those mills, turned them into housing and retail in parts of the University of Massachusetts at Lowell. This has become the Charleston, South Carolina of New England. All began with a vision for the future. Or how about this abandoned torpedo factory in Alexandria, now the largest working art center in the United States? 
with over 100 working artists in this building getting millions of visitors a year. How about Columbus, Ohio? Had a, excuse me, Columbus, Georgia had a terrible flood on the Chattahoochee River. And they didn't see that as a, anything but an opportunity. So they built one of the great river walks in America. And now, of course, their downtown has come back to life. Or how about just uh, taking the flood walls and turning them into art galleries like they've done now in Paducah? Or in Rapid City, where they used to debate how much parking they had, where they took the parking lot out and put a park in. And by the way, it's an ice skating rink in the winter. And it's brought people back into the town. I already showed you this one, the Akron Grain Elevators, now we're at the Hilton Hotel. Or how about this one? You've all heard of the High Line in New York City. How about the small town version of the High Line, the High Bridge, Poughkeepsie? New York, 274 feet above the Hudson River, the highest bridge above the Hudson River, it is now a state park, attracting 800,000 visitors a year to this small town in upstate New York. Successful communities use education, census partnerships, and voluntary initiatives. Why do we educate? In order to reduce the need to regulate. Why do we educate? Because people won't embrace what they don't understand. Why do we educate? Because people have a right to choose the future, but to know what the choices are. And yes, we do need to use incentives, and there's all kinds of incentives, more than free coats we could be giving out. Things like historic preservation tax credits or expedited permit review, I could go on and on. Here's an example. This is the abandoned Lone Star Brewery. For 25 years it was abandoned until they used an historic preservation tax credit and turned into a great museum of art. Or how about conservation easements of voluntary initiatives? Save your view and get a tax break, too. You know, that's a voluntary. How about Yazoo City, Mississippi, where all they did was pass out free paint, and they painted it their way back to vitality of a voluntary initiative. Successful communities pick and choose. Successful communities have hometown heroes. And I understand it's not always easy getting things done in small towns in America. And no matter what people would propose to do in Montpelier or any other community, there always be the people who would tell you, no, can't do it, won't work, tried it already, it costs too much. And every community has the naysayers. And yet, you know, I want to tell you, no is a powerful word in small town America, but I want to tell you a more powerful word, yes. Yes, we can make this a better place to live in, to look at, to work in, to visit. And, you know, it's interesting, if you don't care who gets the credit, you can get an awful lot done in America. I love this quote from Monty Python. He talks about, he's talking about the Romans. He says, apart from sanitation, medicine, education, wine, public order, roads, irrigation, public health, and freshwater system, what have the Romans ever done for us? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a vision counts, but implementation is priceless. Thank you so much for having me here. comments from the audience. Yes, sir. Surface parking costs three to five thousand dollars a space. Structure parking costs fifteen to twenty thousand dollars a space. Underground parking costs fifty thousand dollars a space. I was at a public hearing in Denver about five years ago, uh, and there was a developer who proposed a new project adjacent to one of their light rail stations called Fast Track, and also next to what's called the Platte River Greenway, which is a bike trail. And the, the city had not changed their parking standards, even if it was next to a transit station and a bike trail. And uh, the developer said something very interesting. He said to the planning commission, he said, you know, I could buy every tenant in this building a brand new bicycle for less cost than the cost of two structured parking spaces. Now think about that. So we're building projects all over the country 
that don't need as much parking. Because brand new, no, brand new apartment building I just did a case study on in Albuquerque, New Mexico, 123 apartments only has 25 parking spaces. Well, how's that work? Well, most of the people who live in the building are young people. They don't own a car anyway, and it's on a bike trail, and they have a car to go stop right there, and it's on a transit line, and it's in a walkable neighborhood. You know, the best solution to, to travel is called being there, okay? And so what we're doing in many places in the country is understanding that the, the, you know, the world has changed in terms of transportation. So we just did a study in partnership uh, with a firm out in Los Angeles that looked at the future of, of parking in America, particularly given all the things I talked about, and something I haven't mentioned at all, which is autonomous vehicles, which we already have the technology for, and it's coming faster than most people would realize. And what, all, what they found was that every person who has studied this, from MIT to UCLA, et cetera, says that in the future, we're gonna need anywhere from 40 to 90% less parking spaces than we have right now. We have over 2 billion parking spaces in America, okay? Which takes up thousands, millions of acres of land. So parking is one of our most, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's our greatest redevelopment opportunity, particularly in our downtown, since every town has these empty lots, parking lots. And the only way you can make, make structured parking work, we're actually building parking lots now that can be deconstructed or converted into something else later on. And so if you're thinking about the future, you need to think about those parking lots as a redevelopment opportunity. And it's not gonna happen overnight in every place. I mean, you're already seeing this happen in all the big hot market cities, but it's gonna eventually come to the smaller towns as well. And you know, I was talking to two people tonight when I was coming in here, both of whom walked here because they live downtown. Not, everybody, not everybody's gonna do that, but you know, it's all about choices. So we, think about this. So would you rather live in a neighborhood where you have to drive your children to school? Or would you rather live in a neighborhood where you drive to school if you wanted to? Or they could walk to school or take a bike to school? You know, I just came back from a month of touring bicycle infrastructure in Europe, in Holland and Belgium and France, Spain. I mean, the reason there's, you know, the big reason people don't ride more bikes in this country is not the weather, it's not topography, it's not culture, it's a fear of getting hit by a car. And in Europe, they have a whole system that you can't get hit by a car because everything is completely separate and safe. And so if you were building more, so that's just one answer to that, is invest more, and by the way, bicycle infrastructure costs a tiny fraction of what car infrastructure costs. So we were looking at, you know, there's a new, uh, in San Francisco, there's a new uh, protected bike lane along Market Street. And that cost about $4 million a mile to build this protected bike lane on the main street in downtown San Francisco. It's expensive. But they're also building a, a bike in the highway called Doyle Drive. That's $720 million a, a mile. They're building a new Bay Bridge. That's $2 billion a mile. So, we're talking about a relative difference. And if you want to, you don't want your taxes to go up for transportation, start investing in alternatives to driving. You know, this is one of the things I learned in you know, Germany. I mean, it's like, you could go to any small town 10 times a day by like, a train. It's like, well, duh. You know, here we have only, we only have decent train service one place in America, from DC to New York. And did you know that Amtrak carries more people than all the airlines combined? Why? Not because it's fast, it's not. Because it's frequent. Every half hour, all day long, you don't have to think about it. You just go down there and get in the train. And would you drive to Philadelphia or fly to Philadelphia? If you could take a train every half hour, you'd be center city to center city. You don't have to go through security, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, part of this is transportation. Part of it is changing the way we think about things. Part of it is understanding the market dynamics. And, you know, small stores are getting smaller. Because your people are ordering things online, they're search shopping online, they're going to pick up things. Do you know we have Walmarts now that are as small as 4,000 square feet? 4,000 square feet. They just built one of that size next to Georgia Tech University. This is a company that had all their buildings for 150,000 square feet. And so, so everything is getting smaller, so you're going to need less parking, and there's a lot of ways to do that. Yes, other thoughts? Yes, sir. Uh,
Yeah, so last year, I, 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 I'm not sure I heard you correctly, but last year I gave a talk similar to this in Manchester, and I went over to the, the bookstore there. What's the name of the bookstore? Northshire. Northshire Bookstore. And the owner of that bookstore was the head of the National Council of Independent Bookstores. And they had just done a study, uh, and what was interesting, so they were telling us that in the first 10 years after Amazon and the invention of Kindles, uh, we lost a thousand bookstores in the United States closed. And, but in the last five years, we've opened 300 new locally owned bookstores. Because people are, you know, first of all, the, the chains, you know, like used to have borders and farms and all these big box stores. Well, they're all closed. Borders is completely gone. Barnes and Noble's on its way. But local is doing better than ever. And partly because local has figured out also the Shire Bookstore doesn't just have to sell books to Manchester, they also can sell online. So everything in retail now is called multi channel, which is, you know, selling online, selling in bricks and mortar. And, and bricks and mortar, even though it's changing, is not dead. If it was, you know, Amazon wouldn't have bought Whole Foods. Amazon's now opening physical bookstores. Not the best thing for locally owned bookstores, obviously, but yes, there's a lot of ways, and, and you've got a new model right here in Vermont. Uh, Paul Broon, the guy I'm going to meet with tomorrow, he, has this idea, he had this idea uh, that if you bought every small town in Vermont, he said, he had needs a couple of needs, like a general store, a nice restaurant, a few things. And what they would do is buy a building, and then they'd find a restaurant tour to come in and run the building, we run the, the restaurant, and then they would sell shares to the community. And so let's say a share was $500. Two shares are a thousand. You can earn the value of your share back by eating in the restaurant, right? That's investing in yourself. And it turns out that if you spend a dollar in a locally owned store, it will recirculate through that community three times more than a dollar spent in a national chain store. So because the local store has a local accountant, a local PR person, a local attorney, whatever. You spend a dollar in Walmart, most of that's going to be in Bill, Arkansas. So part of it is just trying to figure out ways that we can help local small businesses and, and help them not only just be a better bricks and mortar store, but help them use new technologies to expand their reach beyond just where they are from a physical standpoint. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. I was stationed in Germany in Darmstadt as a military policeman, and I had to agree with my daughter. My daughter went to the University of Alabama, and she would agree with my statement at that time. They came to their own community because most of the rooms were nice here, absolutely. And if the governor was here, it would be nice, but he does nothing. Yeah, I'm all in favor of cleaning up pollution. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So there's a lot of different ways to achieve density without height. 
I don't know about the specifics of the uh, project in Burlington. I do know that they're tearing the mall down and putting the street grid back, which I think is generally a good thing. Uh, and, and because malls, as I said before, are not doing well, all the malls are being redone. But most of the developers will tell you they need a certain amount of density in order to pay for the units that they have to, in order to do all the, the things that they need to do. So part of it is understanding how to read a performer. Uh, and there's a, uh, there used to be a little publication here in Vermont called Planning Commissioner's Journal. And you can go online and get their article. They have a whole great article on there about how to read performers. And if you Google my name, you can get an article about height and density and why we don't always need height to it. So that's a good point. In the back. Yeah. Well, the, the answer to, to that is no one has done a uh, great job of that. I mean, with all the hot market cities, the, the biggest problem now is the affordability issue. And, and I think the problem with affordable housing in most of the cities that are really growing very rapidly is not, we, we, we've never built our way out of the affordable housing problem because we tear down more affordable units every year than we build new. And so what we need to do is figure out ways to save and preserve existing units. So I'll just give you an example. So I live in a little town, it's a, the oldest suburb of Washington called Tacoma Park, Maryland, right on the DC line. And there's another suburb right next to it, it's called Silver Spring. And Silver Spring used to be very run down, and now it's like exploded. And so we have, uh, and they're building apartment buildings like crazy, but what they do is, so the apartments keep getting smaller and smaller, and the rents keep getting higher and higher. So we have a, a, we have, we've got a, a project with about 400 old garden apartments. And uh, Maryland has an inclusionary housing ordinance. So if you build a new unit, uh, if you build anything over 15 units, uh, you have to have 20% of it has to be affordable. But let's say you're building a, a new development with uh, 500 units. So 20% of that would be, what, 100 units. But in order to do that, they're tearing down 400 existing units. So what we're doing is we're trading off 400 existing affordable apartments for only 100 new ones. And that's going on everywhere. And we can't win the battle like that. So we've got to change our strategies. And I think preservation is part of it. One of the things I love about Vermont is the Vermont Affordable Housing and Conservation Trust Fund, where most of your affordable housing projects in this state have been done in, in restored historic buildings, like old high schools, old elementary schools, and also in town, because one of the things we've also learned is that people my age want to age in place. Most people, uh, if you talk to people at AARP, most people don't want, like, like me, don't want to live with just a bunch of other old people. They like to live, like, with everybody, right? Because, you know, when you live with everybody, you don't feel as old as if you're just living with a bunch of older people. So aging in place is kind of important, and also building housing in places where people don't need a car for everything, because once you are, you know, too, old or too young or too disabled to drive, you're out of luck in America unless you're in some place that you can get around without a car for every single thing. I, we, I live in a, we have this thing in Tacoma Park Valley called the Village of Tacoma. And when I became disabled a few years ago, I signed up and I have five young people in my driveway after snow and they're driving, they're shoveling my driveway out. But in return, I mentor young people and my wife is a part of the walking school bus system and she goes and gets, picks up prescriptions for people. It's all young people helping older people, older people helping younger people. So we need to do things like that. There's also things like if you were to do a survey of like everybody in this room, I would guarantee you that there are a lot of people my age in this room who have extra bedrooms in their house. And there are people like me all over the country and there are young people who are looking for apartments or a, a room to rent. And there's gotta be some way we can put those two things together somehow uh, to help both people at the end of the So there's a lot of different approaches to that. One of my favorite groups is a group called the Institute for Local Self-Reliance in Minneapolis, and they've got a lot of ideas on this kind of stuff. But great question. Time for one more, and then I'll let you guys get out of here. Yes, sir. Uh, is your PowerPoint presentation available online? Yes, uh, this presentation is available online as well as a, a really short 15-minute version I did a TED Talk on. So yes, it is available online.
you talk. You two, you go, just Google Ed McMahon TED Talk or Ed McMahon Talks and you'll get a zillion more things. <laughs> so thank you very much for having me. Thank you.